live from Canada. It's Jim's Record Party. Hello everybody. Welcome back to Jim's Record Party. I'm your host James. So nice for you to be with us today as we'll be looking at the great, the greatest Baroque composer, Johann Sebastian Bach. And we start with this beautiful 10 inch 33 and a third by the greatest organist of all generations, she was called by her organ teacher, Jean de Monsieur. In 1947, she became the first woman organist ever to receive a recording contract with DECA. And this is that DECA recording featuring the Toccata and Fugue in D minor. This is, this is beautiful playing. This is clear playing. This is an organ that has a clarity to it that is very unusual to hear. Her touch, the amount of sustain she allows these notes to have, the virtual lack of reverb, of an over-reverb. There is some room sound here, but it's a very clean room sound. Very beautiful um, playing on the Takada and Fugue. It's said that she, Jean always performed from memory. She had a repertoire of over 2,500 pieces, an active repertoire at any time she had any of those 2,500 pieces under her fingers. That is phenomenal, ladies and gentlemen. And this Jean de Monsieur, 1921 to 1968, the greatest organist of all generations. Number two, could probably only follow Jean de Monsieur, it's Bach Stokowski, the legendary conductor of the Philadelphia Philharmonic, Mr. Leopold Stokowski, a great conductor, a great musicologist, a great arranger, a great, perhaps a greater performer sometimes. This man did not lack for ego or for projects to work on. Remember, if you will, this is a man who in the early, the early 1900s mounted a production of Gustav Mahler's Symphony No. 8, I believe it is in E flat. Correct me if I'm mistaken, please, in the comments. The Symphony of a Thousand, and it's not named that just offhandedly, it's calls for a production that's rather outsized, ladies and gentlemen, and Leopold did that with eight soloists, an orchestra of 110, supplemented by a course of 900, that's right, 950 voices, two 400 voice choirs, supplemented by a 150 voice children's choir and they toured with this band. Don't ever let it be said that the great big bands of the 30s and 40s died out because they couldn't afford to pay their men. They toured with 950 members to mount a production of Gustav Mahler's Symphony of a Thousand. They outfitted train cars. They took a train. I believe they contracted a train to take them to New York, uh, played in Philadelphia, of course, and other cities. This man is not shy. This is an, these are orchestral transcriptions of Bach. It's not said in the liner notes that it's played by the Philadelphia Orchestra. It may not be, but these are beautiful pieces. Some of them a bit, a bit gaudy, just slightly so, but very pleasurably so. So nice to hear the different textures and timbres and, and the depth and weight that Bach can have when mounted with a symphony orchestra. Just absolutely beautiful, uh, classic album, somewhat conservative playing, but <clears throat> of its time, exceptional. Number three is a very fun album, ladies and gentlemen. You may be familiar with this album. It's Bach's Greatest Hits by the Swingle Singers. This is from 1963. This album won the Grammy in 1964 for the best performance by a course and also won the best new artist album. This is the original French and European release, which was called Jazz Sebastian Bach. 
but thinking that North Americans weren't educated or hip enough to realize that that meant Johann Sebastian Bach, they renamed the album, recovered it, and re released it as Bach's Greatest Hits in North America. This is a very fun album with the Swingle Singers, as you may know, sing a vocalese on perfect note-for-note -note transcriptions of Bach pieces. A couple of these pieces have been transposed to a different keys to accommodate the uh, range of the human voice, and all songs are accompanied by a uh, basically a jazz uh, rhythm section of drums and stand-up bass. They're very nice, very swinging tunes. They have a light texture because of the voices, a mixed male and female course of voices, a small grouping of voices. This was founded by, you may think, if, you're, if you think, as I did, that this was named the Swingle Singers because of they, they swing so well, you would be, like I was, mistaken. They, in fact, they were founded by a gentleman named Ward Swingle, who came from Mobile, Alabama, but put this group together in France, in Paris, and toured all over the world with it. This album is very interesting. The lead soprano on all of these early original Swingle Singer cuts was Christiane Legrand. And if that name sounds familiar, it should. She is the sister of the great French jazz pianist, composer, and film composer, Michelle Legrand. And in fact, Michelle used the Swingle Singers on some cuts. And interestingly, also an album I've never seen, I'd love to, uh, to run into this album, the Swingle Singers recorded an album with the Modern Jazz Quartet. So I think that would be a very interesting uh, backing to hear uh, vibes and piano along with the vocals, bass and drums. This is a, a fantastic album. Keep your eyes open for this, ladies and gentlemen. Here in North America, it's Bach's Greatest Hits by the Swingle Singers, 1963. Number four, we get back to Sirius with Pablo Cassells and the, his accompanist on this recording, uh, the pianist Paul Baumgartner. This is from the Prod Festival, which Cassells himself founded in 1950, and this recording is from that inaugural uh, festival in 1950. This is uh, the, the Sonatas Numbers 1 and 2 by Bach for cello and piano. This is a, a, a very nice recording, somewhat a not staid, but um, it's elegant in its own way, and it does sound live, though there is absolutely no audience interaction, no audience sound, no clapping, no coughing, nothing. No audience at all can be heard on this album. So though I do feel it is a live album from the festival itself, inaugural's uh, year of 1950, um, there's no audience sound on it, but this is a beautiful original uh, release of this on Columbia, mono recording of course, ladies and gentlemen, Pablo Cassells uh, weighing in here at 1950 brings us to a very interesting recording by the great flautist Marcel Moyes. A recording from 1935. This is Bach on both sides. On uh, the other side it's the Brandenburg Concerto number no. 5, which features a nice, uh, nice flute. But the uh, side we're looking at is uh, the side with the uh, sonata, uh, the suite rather, number two in B minor, and the ending movement of which we would all be able to whistle uh, the moment along with the moment we heard it. Um, and when it comes here at the end of the side, it it flies by so quickly, you want to replay it three or four times to hear it again and again. Marcel Moyes has credentials like nobody's business. This is a man who played in the premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Just think about that for a moment. He played in the premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. If he can top that, he also played the lead flute in Claude Debussy's Afternoon of a Fawn. And 
many, many, many other examples. This man is a monster of the first rank, ladies and gentlemen. Playing here with the Adolf Busch players, a small chamber um, uh, orchestra, we'll call it. Adolf Busch himself on violin, and Rudolf Serkin, the great classical pianist on piano. And if you sometimes reach for Rudolf Serkin's um, originality, Rudolf Serkin, the American pianist, and you stumble for a moment, it's with good reason. He's a Bohemian-born Austrian-American. Rudolf Serkin, fantastic piano, and of course, fantastic flute on this, ladies and gentlemen. Um, from 1935, a beautiful recording, in mono, of course, and lovely, absolutely lovely. Brings us to our final selection, and perhaps the most fun selection today, ladies and gentlemen. It's Virgil Fox, from 1970. It's Bach Live, the Fillmore East, Virgil Fox, heavy organ. This is Virgil Fox, a man who made his bones basically at the Riverside Church in New York for a couple of decades, um, and then went on to play the heavy organ uh, concerts, among others, uh, ably assisted by Joe's Lights, who assisted many rock and blues and psychedelic acts at the Fillmore's, East and West, I believe. Here they are at the Fillmore East in New York, of course. Virgil Fox, uh, absolutely fantastic player here with the Rogers Touring Organ. I'd like to know what's happened to that instrument, ladies and gentlemen. That instrument needs to have the dust blowing off of it and brought back into circulation. Beautiful sound, a hundred and some odd speakers, as Virgil points out, are pointing at the audience here. It's a lovely big, uh, not quite cathedral sound, but a, a lovely sound here. Very direct, taken off the board, of course. Uh, the Bach Fugue in A minor, the Bach Pasichelian Fugue in C minor, amongst other tunes. He does a short um, introduction to each tune. It's pointed out that the audience was made up of hippies and older straight people, many of them I'm sure uh, uh, people who attended the Riverside services and heard him play there. And he gives a fantastic performance, a fun performance here, and a, and a very excellent sounding here uh, performance. There are many other, several other versions of the Bach uh, heavy organ tour on record. This is the original, the first heavy organ, a beautiful, beautiful record, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Virgil Fox was the first non-German organist given permission to perform in the Thomas Kirk in Leipzig, and that's Johann Sebastian Bach's own stomping grounds, the church that he finished his career in. For Virgil Fox to have an opportunity to play that organ in public was was a, absolutely a, a beautiful career a bit of acknowledgement from the Germans. This has beautiful sonorities and dynamics on it, beautiful dynamics. You need to turn your system up for this record, ladies and gentlemen, to hear the soft parts and to let the loud parts pin you back to the wall. This is beautiful, exuberant, exuberant, vivacious audience response on this. They are there. They, they can't wait to show him their love. He tells them that Johann Sebastian Bach would be very pleased that they are there and they are very pleased that Virgil Fox is there on a, a beautiful evening and I believe it's 1970, it may have been recorded in 69. Um, in New York City at the Fillmore East. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, that brings us to the end of another episode of Jim's Record Party. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, this examination of some albums featuring the works of the great composer, the father of us all, Johann Sebastian Bach. Please join us again next time on this very same station as we look at more great, rare, and interesting records here on Jim's Record Party.